The reality to which these words point is so far greater than the word that it's usually misleading to even say it. But now I've said it. <laughs> what flows through you when we call it intelligence or great power that deals with any problem, any challenge, there is no problem, that arises, it's not just that. That which flows through you is also love, that energy stream, that hope that is there when that openness is there. And it doesn't matter what your life situation is or how much future you have left, if that is there even an hour before you die, that is the flowering of your life. There is no thing as your life, we are just using it as an expression. It's the flowering of consciousness through this form. It's the birth of that into this world. And then the mind comes, okay, then what happens after that? <laughs> It wants to know what comes next, what comes after it has flowered. Maybe there's a question in the basket about it. <laughs> Let it flower first and then see what happens. Extreme challenges have the ability potentially to push you into the state of presence, to force you into the state of presence. Little challenges, which are the majority of challenges, usually pull you into unconsciousness. Unless you now know that you can actually use whatever, so to speak, goes wrong in your life as your spiritual practice. Ah, great, here's another one. And then you bring the allowing to it and the attention. And you look. You look at the cold soup, you look at the the lost bell that was here. Oh, my bells, I've had them for years. A friend of mine gave them to me and, and the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama gave them to my friend. <laughs> and they are gone. Somebody t must have taken them. Oh, no. Can't be. And instead, you look where the bells were before, there's now an empty space. Well, now they are back, but there, there, was, an empty, there was an empty space. Now, there's something deeply significant about the empty spaces that are left behind by any kind of loss. For example, these were the bells. You may get back to your car, or where your car once was, <laughs> <laughs> and in the in the parking lot there's only an empty space and here it is vital if you can stop and face that empty space without running away from it or cursing the empty space or immediately going into reactive just this is very strange 
And this is one example. The empty space can also be left by relationships. The wife, the partner, the husband. One day you get home and there's a letter where it says, I'm gone. I'm out of here. I... And if you can, again, you at that moment, what the form that this moment takes, we we'll use that expression here, and here we come to something very significant. The form that this moment takes sometimes is an absence of the form that was there a moment before. <laughs> And because suddenly there is a no form where there was a form before, that is an enormous opening into the deeper awareness of the formless consciousness, unconditioned formless that you are. If you can not run away from it, if you can face this death, because the loss of anything is a small death, the loss of the bells, that you've had for years is a small death because the form is gone. The loss of your BMW is a death. Uh, the Rolls Royce, an even bigger death. And of course, there may be an actual death, and this is an amazing thing. The, the person that was here every day in this room used to sit in this chair, that's the armchair, that's where the desk where they sat, and one day the message comes, they're gone, passed away. And then you look at the empty chair. The, the person was so, it was so real. It seemed so permanent to have that personality sitting in that armchair, doing its thing, its work, talking, having its opinions, being there. How is it, it's inconceivable that suddenly it's, that, that person is, where is he? Dissolved just dissolved like a soap bubble gone and and so most people this is the empty space that is left behind by death when it's whenever a form dissolves in your life it may be an actual death it may be the loss of something that had been important to you if you can face that hole that is left behind by the form that is no longer there it's a temporary hole into the dimension of the formless now one could almost say God we're using that word again the formless one life, the formless, timeless one consciousness that underlies all manifestation momentarily shines through whenever there is a hole in the tapestry of physical existence. That's kind of the tapestry of forms. And in this tapestry of forms, which is gigantic, regularly, or all the time, holes appear. If you were watching, let's just use the metaphor and say, the entire physical universe, sense-perceived universe, imagine it as a, 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 an extremely complex tapestry woven huge of course 
and you look at it and then you see continuously here and there little things suddenly disappearing and temporary holes being there opening up in the tapestry and then suddenly there and there so part of this tapestry it's he continuously coming and going out and into form no form in this tapestry remains for long and so holes open up continuously in it and then are replaced by something else but if you can be aware of the holes the openings something shines through them that is not to do with form but it's the essence of all form and that is enormously peaceful there's enormous peace and aliveness there and that is the grace that lies concealed in any kind of death accidental death seemingly premature death any kind of death and any kind of loss potentially but it does not help you if you deny it or run away from it you say no don't want to see that lo that hole and you cover up the hole with reactions immediately so that you don't have to face the emptiness so when emptiness comes in your life that is a beautiful potentially a beautiful opening in which you can actually find yourself you find yourself by not resisting that and so the you begin to welcome death when it comes because it is an inseparable part of this world of form and when we look at death we judge it from the point of view of the as an identity a sense of self that is identified with form and from there death looks horrible it looks dreadful that's why nobody dares speak about it in western culture which is the most identified with egoic forms nobody dares maybe one of the few countries left where death is still natural is India where it's in the street you can go to the bonfires where they burn the dead bodies every day you can watch a very deep meditation if you can be there in a state of complete openness and just watch that's the destiny of every form is to dissolve again quickly and when you watch, contemplate the dissolving of forms, that which is beyond form arises in you. You get, you get, you come, you are in touch then with the formless in you. That's the grace of death, which is not the opposite of life. It's only the opposite of birth. People think life and death, it's a question of life and death. No, it's a question of birth and death. Life is eternal. Life cannot be destroyed. Forms, yes. Even physicists know that no energy is destroyed ever. And in a wider sense, as you live in the present, more and more it's a continuous dying as the expression goes you die 
to the past every moment. You let go and this moment is always fresh. You can of course you remember what you need to remember but you let go of any personalized attachment to a memory. There's nothing wrong with memories. You need it. You wouldn't be able to find your way back to, to your street, your house. Memory, of course you need, but self-identification with memory, you don't. So, as you live in presence, there's a continuous dying to this continuity of me, which is an accumulation of more and more things that I identify with, the continuity. And that is, could be anything. You die to the past. When the bell is gone, it is gone. It, is, it has disappeared. It is the past. And this moment remains fresh. Oh. There is a freshness even in when something has dissolved. One could go so far as to say there is a, a breath of fresh air, metaphorically speaking, comes into this world of space-time, this world of physicality, Whenever a form dissolves, there's a lightness. And with that, you welcome death. Stillness is the death that you enter voluntarily. If you're ready for it. To relinquish your attachment to the structures of thought, to step out of the stream of thinking is death, because thinking is form, primordial form. To step out of that is death. The arising of stillness is your death, the death of the little me. Of course it is. And there are still many humans on the planet who are not ready for that. They want to stay entangled in form. They want a continuation of the drama of form. They don't want an end to the drama. There are humans, many humans still on the planet who are not ready for the end of suffering. Even if the possibility were presented to them, they would run away in fear. It would seem like, no, the end of suffering would seem like a kind of death, the end of my drama, and I don't want that. So, But there are many humans also who are ready to stop suffering, to come to the end of suffering. It's an evolutionary development. Now for this to, this shift to happen to you, there's one requirement and we can put it in simple language. You need to be fed up with suffering. Not, not run away from it, not avoid it, but be fed up with it. You've had enough. I've had enough. And if you are in psychological suffering, and all suffering is psychological suffering, the rest may be pain, toothache, whatever it may be. You can ask yourself at any moment when you can see that you are in suffering 
Is that what I want? Is that what I'm choosing at this moment? Is that what I'm creating at this moment? Humanity as a whole is coming to the point where the suffering is just too much. It's been going on for so long. And for most of you it is true that you have suffered enough. But it means to be it needs to be true for you. That realization needs to come to you. So that no situation, nothing that happens to you is converted into drama and suffering anymore. And the quickest way out of that, out of converting events, situations, interactions with people into drama and suffering is to be present moment centered not story centered not thought centered not imposing interpretations and stories on the present moment allowing the moment to be as it is I gave a simple example of what is what the mechanism that makes up the manufacture of drama and suffering in people's lives, the mental mechanism, the mechanicalness behind it. I gave a brief example in this little book, Stillness Speaks, where in one entry, one entry starts with three statements. One statement says, what a miserable day. The other, statement, the other statement says, he didn't have the decency to return my call. The other statement says, she let me down. Then the text explains a little bit that these are stories that you impose on situations, events, and people in your life. And those are simple, very simple examples, but even the complicated drama basically works according to that same principle. It's just that the stories that you impose become more complex. But this is where they start. And the stories are imposed, in many cases, one of their main reasons for being there is to enhance your egoic, mind-made sense of self. To be right. Because if you are right, if you can complain about this miserable weather, unconsciously, the mechanism behind is that you've made the weather wrong and yourself right. You are in a superior position because you are complaining about it. What this dreadful weather is just dreadful. If you can say he didn't have the decency to return my call, it implies, this is unconscious, that you, of course, are morally superior in every way to this person. This is the position that you are coming from and identify with. I'm not saying you do not see that certain people do very unconscious things. You see it. But the story then personalizes it. You find a reactive and personalized relationship to somebody's perhaps unconsciousness and then use it to enhance your mind-made sense of self. <laughs> it doesn't mean you don't see dysfunctional behavior for what it is, but you do not have a personalized reactive relationship to it anymore. You allow that to be also. There is no person there. There is only human unconsciousness. 
you don't enter into that personalized relationship that form that is based story based she let me down she wasn't there i was there she was not that's the event without the story it's raining that's the miserable day without the story He didn't call. That's the event. Without the story, he didn't have the decency to return my call. <laughs> It's amazing how simple things, uh, if you take away the story, the simplicity of what is, without the personalized story around it, how simple life then becomes. <laughs> how simple this moment always is without imposing a story on it which is in any case only there in the service of being right in the service of feeling superior to the situation or the person in the service of enhancing your always deficient mind-made egoic sense of self this is all madness dysfunction if you look at see what people how people complicate their lives so for nothing for an illusory identity <laughs> and then what is left then is things are as they are at this moment people do what they do at this moment beautifully illustrated in the story that you may have heard perhaps through this mouth before in the story of the zen master some of you probably don't know it so but it's such a beautiful story the zen master who had a excellent reputation as a great teacher in a town in japan and one day was accused by the 17 year old girl next door of being the father to her um, her child that had just been born the parents asked who is the father they were shocked that she was giving birth to a baby And she finally said, it was the master next door. I went to see him nine months ago for a spiritual counseling session. And then that's when he did it to me. And so the parents, the parents got extremely angry and started telling everybody about it. And they ran to the Zen master and with the baby and put it there on his floor and said, we know what you did. You are responsible. Now you look after the baby. We don't want anything to do with this baby anymore. You take it. You are the father. We know it all now. The Zen master looked and listened. And when they said, you are the f 